How many of you treat people with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia? Common problem. Uh, how do I say, a lot of that going around. Well, the focus today will be to teach you clinically how to get these people well in an organized manner. And one of the problems that we have is that you'll see literally hundreds of different treatments being proposed, uh, and it gets really confusing after a while. It's like, is it this, is it that, is the other? So by the end of the talk today, you'll be able to organize it all in a way that's gonna make a lot of sense. Now, in terms of the scope of the problem, uh, pain, fatigue, uh, these are epidemic. Uh, you'll see uh, that about 31% of adults comp complain of chronic fatigue. It's almost become the rule rather than the exception. You'll see about six to 24 million people will have chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia related processes. Um, only 15% have been given the correct diagnosis. Most are told, well, you're working too hard, you're not working hard enough, you're crazy, you have too many kids, and they're given all kinds of things. Uh, but only 15% have been told what they actually have. You'll see that one out of four Americans suffer unnecessarily with chronic pain. And 70 million Americans have trouble sleeping. So these are very, very common problems. These are problems that people have been failed by the medical system, and they're gonna be coming to you because their doctor, by and large, is often gonna be clueless. And they go to many doctors, and uh, the, the person says, oh, I've got fibromyalgia, and the doctor says, uh, fibromyalgia? <laughs> and then they start to act as if, I don't know what's wrong with you, so you're crazy? It gets really nasty. Um, the good news is that this is very, very, very treatable by using the best of standard and holistic medicine. Uh, a term that Dr. Yu Reardon had coined, I find to be excellent, comprehensive medicine, the best of all worlds. So we'll take a look um, at our published uh, double line study, looking at the treatment we're going to talk about today, using an integrated approach to treatment. And the study showed that most people can get well. Let's start by a very simple basic. How do you recognize people with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia? If people come to you and they're complaining that they have widespread pain, they have pain in many parts of the body, and or if they say, Doc, I'm exhausted, to find out if they have fibromyalgia, all you have to do is ask them one question. Can you get a good night's sleep? If they say, oh yeah, I can sleep just fine, no problem, they don't have fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. They have another cause of their fatigue. It's really that straightforward. And we'll talk about why that is in just a little bit. But basically, if they're complaining of fatigue or widespread pain, what question are you gonna ask them? This may be on the board questions. What question will you ask? Can I get a good night's sleep? And that will identify right off the bat. It's that simple to make the diagnosis. Now, let's take a look at a study. This is one of our earlier studies, and it basically did an integrated treatment plan of what we're uh, gonna be talking about today. And what the study showed, 91% of people with a CFF and fibromyalgia had moderate to marked improvement in their symptoms. 91%. This is a very, very treatable disease. So let's take a look at the study. Um, titled Effective Treatment for CFS and Fibromyalgia, a placebo-controlled study. Uh, it was basically classic, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, intent-to-treat analysis. Um, for the outcome measures, we, uh, I still remember I was at an NIH conference in the early 90s, and it was on chronic fatigue syndrome. And they brought together experts, each of which went on stage and said, I have no idea why I'm here. I don't even know what chronic fatigue syndrome is. And the conclusion of the study, of the conference, was there's no way to tell if people are getting better, so we can't do any research on chronic fatigue syndrome. I wanted to grab them by the neck and say, ask them. So one of the four outcome measures in our study was we asked people, how are you feeling? Much better, better, same, worse, much worse. And what you'll see, uh, 16 of the 32 people in the active group rated themselves as much better, uh, as opposed to three in the placebo group, 13 better but not cured. So 29 out of 32 better. Um, 
If you're looking at the visual analog scale, uh, the average increase in quality of life was 75% average at the end of three months, going up to 90% of two years follow-up. Um, many of you have seen that to give people something, they get a bit better, but now you've stressed one system and the other systems start to crash. So they feel better for a couple weeks and they crash and burn. So we did the two-year follow-up study. People continue to get better and better. So this is a good long-term effective treatment. So we have a double-bind study showing that effective treatment is now available for CFS and fibromyalgia. And let's take a look at the disease in a little more depth, and we'll go into how to treat it. We talked about tired, achy, brain fog, can't sleep as hallmarks of this disease. But there are many other symptoms as well. Uh, you'll find many people have allergies, multiple food allergies, sensitivities. Uh, Patrick gave an excellent talk earlier about the problems with digestion and the role that per digestion plays in increasing food allergies, along with leaky gut. Um, many of you will find that people come and they say they're allergic to everything. And there's a very simple technique. Um, how many of you have heard of NAET? It's non budrapat allergy elimination technique. It's an acupressure technique that gets rid of allergies. Um, it is so effective. Uh, a study that our foundation funded was using NAT to treat autism. 23 of the 30 autistic kids at the end of one year of treatment were back in regular school, as opposed to zero out of 30 in the untreated control group. So when you're looking at sensitivities, understand that it's poor digestion, leaky gut, and You'll see the candida contributes to leaky gut, along with adrenal problems that contribute to the allergies. But if you want to get rid of the sensitivities, doing what Patrick talked about, with the adding you know, the HCL and adding the uh, plant-based digestive enzymes and treating the gut dysbiosis. But the NAT treatment is very, very helpful. And you can find at NAT thousands of practitioners, nat.com. Uh, brain fog is a classic symptom. Uh, chronic sinusitis. Most people have nasal congestion, post-nasal drip, spastic colon. All of those tend to reflect the candida. When you treat the candida, those problems tend to resolve. Uh, you'll see frequent infections. Uh, two studies in our center showed an average 32 and a half pound weight gain. So you're talking about chronic pain, no brain, exhausted, everybody thinking you're crazy, and now you put on 32 pounds. This is not a fun disease for people. 73% uh, of folks, when you ask, how's your libido? The answer is, what libido? So there are many, many different symptoms. Numbness, tingling, neuropathic symptoms, host of symptoms. So what causes CFS and fibromyalgia? We talked about how you recognize it. Can't sleep even though you're exhausted and have widespread pain. Uh, key point number two, this is an energy crisis where people have essentially blown a fuse. In your home, if you plug in too many space heaters or blow dryers, what happens? Click the circuit breaker, the lights go out. In this illness, when you spend more energy than you're able to make for any of hundreds of reasons, the area that uses the most energy for its size goes offline first. And that area is the hypothalamus. So basically, people have blown a fuse. They have hypothalamic dysfunction. Uh, common ways to blow a fuse, infections. And I, I used to call this, I still call it, the infection of the month club. Every month, it seems like they come up with a new infection that this is the cause of chronic fatigue syndrome. And it's like, after 35 years of working in this disease, you realize it's not one infection. There are literally dozens, maybe hundreds of infections that can blow a fuse. Hormonal deficiencies any of a number of hormonal deficiencies. Um, food sensitivities, uh, toxins, toxic chemical exposures, toxic boss exposures, toxic spouse exposures, all kinds of ways to blow a fuse here. Um, stress, poor sleep, anything that disrupts sleep. So basically, this is an energy crisis where people have blown a fuse. So let's take a look at the hypothalamic function for a moment. That's a circuit breaker. It's no damage to it. It just goes into hibernation mode. Um, and if you understand the hypothalamic dysfunction going on, you'll understand why people have the mix of symptoms they have. The hypothalamus key circuit breaker controls sleep 
which is why that simple question, can you get a good night's sleep, is so awesome in this disease. It controls hormonal function through the pituitary, thyroid, adrenal, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. It controls temperature regulation, so 98.6 is a fever. And it controls autonomic function, blood pressure, pulse, peristalsis, sweating. Now, if you understand that it controls peristalsis, you'll understand Patrick earlier was talking about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And the reason we see that in fibromyalgia is that the food has trouble moving from this end out the other end. And when food moves slowly through the small intestine, it's like an obstruction in the bladder or anywhere else. The bacteria is kept fairly, the small intestine, I didn't realize this until about five years ago, is fairly sterile. In fact, the, the definition for SIBO is the same as the number of bacteria for a bladder infection. The small intestine keeps things moving downstream and washes the bacteria into the colon. When you have poor movement or peristalsis, you get backwash of the bacteria. So you'll see that at fibro in general, but you're also going to see that from low thyroid. And a critical part of treating small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is to treat the thyroid. So the hypothalamus controls sleep, hormonal function, temperature, autonomic function. This small area requires a massive amount of energy for what it does. And because of that, what you'll find is that it goes offline first during an energy crisis. That's why it acts like a circuit breaker. Um, people then ask, well, why do we get pain? Well, muscles take a lot of energy as well. And when muscles don't have enough energy, they get locked in the shortened position. And you'd think that it takes energy for muscles to contract. But think about it, writer's cramp, rigor mortis, tight as a board. When your muscles get exhausted, they go tight. They get locked in a shortened position, and they hurt. So this chronic muscle pain will go ahead and be the initial trigger for pain. Anytime you have chronic pain, including chronic muscle pain, it then will trigger neuropathic pain, central sensitization, small fiber, neuropathies, things like that. But as Robert was saying in his talk, uh, you put a needle in a trigger point, it's going to release. 70% of trigger points correspond with acupuncture points. And if you go ahead and put a needle in either of those, they will release. One of the reasons fibromyalgia can respond very well to acupuncture. So people come in, they say, Doc, I hurt all over. I'm exhausted. You ask them one question, which is, can I get a good night's sleep? Hint, hint. OK. Um, you say, hey, you blew a fuse. And you want to figure out how they blew the fuse, what caused them to trip a circuit breaker. One simple question really helps separate out the groups nicely. When did this illness start? Or you can ask them, did it start suddenly or gradually? If people say, well, you know, I've been sick for about five, eight years, but felt kind of lousy for eight or ten years, gradual onset. Uh, gradual onset, you want to think about hormonal problems like low thyroid, perimenopause, um, candida infections, classic, probably most important single infection, uh, autoimmune diseases, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, all of these will trigger very frequently a secondary fibromyalgia. And what happens is that the rheumatologist doesn't recognize the fibros there, so they keep whacking them with prednisone and uh, chemo agents and really heavy-duty medications trying to knock out the inflammation, when the problem is not the inflammation, it's secondary fibro. You treat with what we'll talk about today, that will get better. So when you have somebody with autoimmune disease, ask them, can you get a good night's sleep? If they say no, consider fibromyalgia being present as well. Um, anything that disrupts sleep will give a gradual onset, severe stress. But some people have a sudden onset. You ask them, when did it start? And they say, April 17th, 1997. Sudden onset. And usually in those cases, it's going to be post-viral or post-infectious. It can be after a parasite or even other infections, after an injury, and after pregnancy. People do fine during pregnancy. It's after the baby is born. It's like pulling the hormonal carpet out from under them, and they crash and burn. So you know, a lot of times, people come in and they say, what's a nice doctor like you doing treating a disease like this? And 
<laughs> well, I got into it the old-fashioned way. I had the disease. Uh, I had what I call the drop-dead flu back in 1975, and it left me uh, near bed-bound. I had to drop out of medical school. Um, being a good Jewish boy, my whole life was gearing, geared to being a healer and a physician, and I figured my life was over. I dropped out of med school. I was paying my own way, which meant I was homeless, living in the parks. Um, and it was funny. It's like the universe put a sign, homeless holistic medical school on my park bench. <laughs> it was interesting. Healers came by. Uh, natural, I almost became a naturopath. And there's a whole other story why I didn't, but that's, uh, we'll leave that for another time. Um, herbalists, energy medicine. I learned chakra work. And through all of that, I learned how to get well. Um, so there I was, dropped out of med school, homeless, best friggin' year of my life, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, it gave me my life back because it taught me what I needed to do to be authentic. I was so busy doing what everybody else thought I should do to please them that I, I wasn't even thinking in terms of a concept of what would I like? What feels good to me? It forced me to get in touch with who I was. And it turned out to be a real gift. And for most of the people who have the disease, as they understand what the illness is telling them, they will look back and say, that was a real blessing. But tell them that after they get better. From the front end of it, you're not going to be able to hear it. So anyway, so people basically have blown a fuse uh, called the hypothalamus. Um, and to turn the circuit breaker back on and restore function, and this will be on the test, maybe, Five key things you need to remember. If you take home one thing from this talk, remember the word shine. This is the recipe for getting people better on a physical level. S stands for sleep. H is hormonal support. I is infections. N is nutritional support and detox. And E is exercise as able. This is what we did in the double bind study. The exercise was open for both uh, placebo and active groups. Um, and <clears throat> what you'll find, if you just use this as a checklist, you will be amazed how most of these other treatments you're going to hear about will fall into place in this organizational structure. So you get people sleeping, and we'll talk about each of these. Um, the hormones, infections, nutrition, exercise as able. That is the physical component of getting people well. There is also the psycho-spiritual component, which is to do what feels good. Basically, teach people to ignore what their brain is telling them. Our brain is a product of our environment growing up. It tells us what we're taught as children, that our parents and school and religions and TV and everybody thought said we should do to, be, to get approval. It has no clue who we are. Our feelings are authentic. If you check in with your feelings, and if something feels good, that's going to be authentic to you. So the psycho-spiritual component of getting well is teaching people to start to pay attention to what feels good and keep their attention on that and do those things. And there's many different techniques for turning off the mental chatter. Um, I'm a bit partial to tequila myself and my ties, but I'll leave that to your creativity. Now, one of the things you're going to find, these are very complicated patients. These people come in, and they ask them, what's wrong with you? And 45 minutes later, they're still listing off th things off. And if you don't have simple approaches to simplify taking care of these people, you will burn out. So one of the things that we made available, I've been doing this for 35 years. We've learned how to make this a very easy and efficient way to get people better. One of the things we have are free treatment tools. They're checklists. You can have the person fill out the questionnaire before they come in and bring it in with them, and it'll take you four or five minutes to go over the questionnaire. Or it'll take them an hour talking about each thing they've got. So these checklists, and they're geared by symptom uh, complexes, thyroid issues, adrenal issues, hormonal issues, candida issues, have them fill out the questionnaire before they come in. Also, do you find yourself, when you're doing treatments, that you're writing out the same treatment over and over through the day? Take this thyroid, take this much, take the da-da-da-da-da. Stop it. They can't read your writing anyway. 
use treatment checklist. You take a little pencil and you go, check, and it's all there. How to do it, what it is, side effects to look for. Um, these tools are available. It's my gift to you to keep you sane. You know, we used to charge for that. Um, you can send us $400 or just we'll send them to you for free. Okay? Um, I, I, I got tempted to charge that so you'll realize that they really are worth using. So if you want to email me at endfatigue at AOL.com, I still have my old anachronistic AOL account, um, I will be happy to go ahead and send you um, the treatment tools, free checklists, questionnaires, the whole thing. Now, also, for those of you who are interested in more uh, information on it, we do trainings um, where uh, I'm happy to train you online, where you can do it with the CD courses, uh, that you can go ahead and learn how to treat this illness. Uh, it's an eight-hour course. It'll make you an expert. Um, but what I want to talk about for a moment before we go on to treatment, uh, there's some sheets on the table. You've noticed that in this workshop, people have talked about acupuncture. They've talked about chiropractic. They've talked about Ayurveda. Do you realize that most MDs, if you talk about Ayurveda, they're going to say, what's that, a fruit? <laughs> most healthcare practitioners have no clue what other practitioners not in their own training are doing. And this is a real problem. When we came out of medical school, you know, looking at those pie charts, didn't they have the impression that we knew 95% of what there was that could help people? And maybe there's 5% of cute little things in herbal medicine or acupuncture that might add, but 95% we knew, because we were doctors. You know, we went through the gauntlet. I now think it's probably closer to maybe 15% or 10% that we know as physicians. As holistic doctors, maybe 30%. But 70% of what's out there to help people, you have no clue about. Neither do I, and I've been doing this a long, long time. So being a troublemaker, we've set up the equivalent of, a, basically it's a Facebook for practitioners, where you can go on and meet and talk to other health practitioners from across the spectrum, energy workers, uh, nutritionists, MDs, DCs, DOs, any health practitioner. And it's basically the, we call it the uh, practitioner's network. It's free. And if you go on there and start communicating, one, you're going to be learning about other practitioners and what they do. Two, you're going to go ahead and start meeting people where you live and developing cross-referral patterns. This will be really good for the people who come see you and also build your practice. Um, and as an additional incentive, uh, you get to be part of what you call the buyer's club. I will go out and negotiate discounts for the members for the main supplement companies. Many of them, the larger ones, have already signed on. Uh, medical products, keep your cost down. It'll be 75 to 10% discounts from these things. All of this is free. I want you to talk to other practitioners. I want you to go and sit around the dinner table with them. You know, I had this picture once I was sitting here getting kind of intoxicated. My ties are good too, and that's just tequila. And there was, I pictured, there was an MD, a chiropractor, a naturopath, an energy worker, sitting around the table having dinner. And I was thinking, what would they say to each other? It would be like first contact between alien species. <laughs> okay. So I invite you to make first contact. Um, the website, it's uh, www.vitality101.com slash FFPN, like Fatigue and Fibromyalgia Practitioner Network. Go on there, sign up, it's free. Uh, you'll get your discounts, there'll be many more discounts coming up. So uh, just, I'm, I'm inviting, I just want to network people together. So anyways, um, blah, 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 okay, blah, okay, next. So let's take a look at Shine. Sleep, hormones, infections, nutrition, exercise. Critical. We're going to start with N. It's the fourth letter in shine, but nutritional support, I think, is one of the critical parts of healing, is giving the body what it needs. I've never ceased to be amazed how if you simply give the body what it needs and get the hell out of its way, people get better. So nutrition is a big, a big thing. Now, people would ask me, well, which vitamin or mineral do I need? And the answer is, all of them. 
you know, by definition. And, you know, why? You know, people say, oh, well, you just, they didn't have multivitamins 500 years ago and you make expensive urine because it all goes out in the urine. Well, 500 years ago, we didn't have 18% of our calories coming from sugar, 18% from white flour, and basically almost half of the vitamins and minerals have been stripped out of the diet and food processing. And there wasn't that much of a surplus to begin with, and you have malabsorption and the other issues. So people need overall nutritional support. And for those experts who say, well, it all goes out on the urine, if you're just making expensive urine, I, I have a simple recommendation. They can stop drinking water. It all goes out in the urine. Then they'll stop annoying people that are trying to get better. So when, you're trying, when you want to give nutritional support, one, an important thing, there's so many things people need in this disease. You don't want them to be part of what I call the handful club, where they're taking handfuls of pills all day. So one of the things that I work on is how to make it really simple for people. Um, I like to use vitamin powders, because one drink literally replaces over 35 pills. And I'll lecture to nutritional conferences, you know, MD, PhD, as, as well as, as uh, clinical nutritionists around the world. And I'll throw out the challenge. And I'll give them a vitamin powder. I say, get what's in that one drink in less than 35 pills. I'll give you 100 bucks. And they can't. So I recommend using powders. It makes it easy. People get everything they need from A to Z. Um, I'm not going to take an hour and go through all the different nutrients people need and why they need them. It's just easier. Get a good vitamin powder. Uh, daily energy infusion is one that I like. Uh, Life extension makes a very good one. It's not hard. There, there's a number of good ones out there. Um, but that gives overall nutritional support. Um, other key things for nutrition, people need to drink more water and eat more salt. Uh, the hormones that are low include antidiuretic hormone. Uh, so the technical description for this disease is to drink like a fish and pee like a racehorse. People will go ahead and urinate a lot, and if they don't drink enough water to keep up with it, they will dehydrate. They also have trouble holding on to salt. If you tell people with this illness to salt restrict, they will crash and burn. They need more salt. Get a good quality sea salt um, and let people eat it to taste. Um, people need to avoid sugar. Now, I do add the three magic words, except for chocolate. I think chocolate's a health food. <laughs> but I still remember when I started in holistic medicine about 35 years ago in the health food store gals, you know, we'd be talking and they'd say, oh, no, no chocolate is bad, eat carob. And I said, we're going to get along really well. Here's my carob, I take your chocolate, we be friends, you know? <laughs> Do you know eating chocolate is associated as more than, it's anywhere from three to 30 times more likely to be associated with not having a heart attack than taking statin medications. And a lot tastier. So anyway, that's a whole nother talk. Chocolate's a health food. So I tell people avoid sugar except for chocolate. I add those three magic words. And you will find that compliance goes up a whole lot. Um, high protein, low carb diet. And for three to nine months, I'll add in several other nutrients. Acetyl L-carnitine. If you look at the studies of muscle biopsies in people with fibromyalgia, they are low across the board, they're carnitine deficient. And it needs to be the acetyl form to get into the mitochondria. A thousand milligrams once or twice a day for, four, for three to nine months. Um, ribose, we'll talk about a couple studies we recently published on that. Uh, wonderful for energy production. Coenzyme Q10. 200 milligrams a day, but have them take it with food or some kind of oil so they absorb it. And then fish oils. Um, I like the ones that are just pure essential fatty acids without the oil. That's pure omega-3s, because that way you just need one a day instead of eight. And, you know, it's funny. People would be taking these eight fish oil pulls a day, and they'd be burping up fish oil, and every cat in the neighborhood would be going, what's that? You know? <laughs> fish oil burps are optional. You know, find ones that have pure omega-3. You'll find them out there, just one a day instead of eight. Now, let's take a look at ribose for a moment. Uh, ribose is an incredible nutrient. It basically, if you take a look at ATP, uh, NADH, FADH, most of the energy molecules have ribose as a backbone. And so most of them have ribose, a B vitamin or phosphates. Well, they all have phosphates. And then they have adenine 
which if you're not familiar with adenine, it used to be called vitamin B4. Ever notice there's B1, B2, B3, B5, B6? I used to wonder, where the hell did B4 go? And it was adenine, and it was, they found out the body had so much of it that they, they devitaminized it. But it's a critical part of nutrition. Um, so the ribose, critical part of energy molecules like ATP and also DNA and RNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid, ribonucleic acid. In energy deficient states, the body has trouble holding on to enough ribose. Ribose is not found in the diet. It's made in the body via the pent pentose phosphate shunt. It's a slow process to rebuild. And I was wondering um, if ribose deficiency might be an important part of the energy crisis in CFS and fibromyalgia. So I went ahead and did an initial study. We took 41 people with fibromyalgia uh, or CFS, and we had them take some ribose, five grams three times a day for three weeks. Um, and what we found was that energy went up an average of 45%, sleep improved, uh, mental clarity improved, pain went down, overall well-being increased by 30%. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. Um, so I went ahead and did a larger study. This was 257 people with CFS and fibromyalgia. It was done at 53 health centers. And what we found, we gave ribose one scoop or five grams three times a day, and it was for three weeks. And, and what we found for these same five parameters just kept going straight up. Energy level increased an average of 61%. Sleep improved, mental clarity improved, pain went down, overall well-being increased 37%. And ribose, it ends in os, is a sugar. It looks and tastes like sugar, so it's really easy. Do not have people take capsules of ribose. It's stupid. It's a sugar. Have them put it in their cereal or food, or their tea. Just a scoop twice a day for most people is fine. For anybody with heart disease, you're going to see that this recipe I've talked about here, the ribose, CoQ10, acetylcarnitine, uh, these are magnesium B vitamins. Sounds amazingly like how you treat heart failure because both are an energy crisis. Both respond to increasing energy production. So when do I use ribose? Anybody with fatigue, pain, heart disease? For most people, I'll give a loading dose of five grams three times a day for three weeks, and then I'll drop it to twice a day. And I tell people, don't worry if they miss one of the doses during the day. Um, personally, what I do each morning for energy, a scoop of the vitamin powder, one scoop of ribose. You'll find that it really leaves you feeling a lot better. Um, main side effect, about 5% of people get over-energized or hyper. Just lower the dose and give it with food. So we've looked at the N in shine, which is nutrition. Let's take a look at the S in shine, which is sleep. Um, anybody want to guess what the average night's sleep was, how many hours a night until 130 years ago? It was nine hours a night average. Average. What happened then? Light bulbs. Thank you, Thomas. Edison. So uh, light bulbs were developed. And since then, sleep has gone down to an average six and three quarter hour a night. That's a 30% pay cut. And so not just are most Americans not making time for sleep, People with CFS and fibromyalgia, because they blew a fuse that controls sleep, the hypothalamus, cannot fall asleep, stay asleep, or go into deep sleep and stay there. There's natural sleep support. There's so many things. Uh, I like there's a mix of uh, the wild lettuce, Jamaican dogwood, hops, passion flower, uh, theanine. Um, you know, hops is a wonderful herb for sleep and a muscle relaxant. If you think that after a kegger, it's just the alcohol that lets college students fall down the steps without hurting themselves? No, the hops. Great muscle relaxant, really good for sleep. You can find all six of these in a single mix. Um, other natural sleep aids, uh, do not give calcium by itself ever, pretty much. Calcium plus magnesium. Melatonin, one half milligram is all it takes uh, for sleep effect. <clears throat> 5-HTP, double blind study, 300 milligrams at bedtime. Very helpful versus placebo for fibromyalgia. But just be careful if they have other serotonin raising medications. Uh, you can drive serotonin too high. So if they're on medications that raise serotonin, I keep it to 200 milligrams. But otherwise, 300 or even 400 milligrams at bedtime. 
The smell of lavender helps sleep. A, smell, a spray or two of lavender on the pillow, a drop of lavender oil on the upper lip. Simple things. And a very, I'm going to give you a high-tech sleep aid. You take two cups of Epsom salts, put in a tub of hot water, and soak an hour before bedtime. And while you're at it, get some red wine for your heart benefits, get some chocolate, put some candles on, light them up. <laughs> you know. Or you can take an Ambien. I, I, take door number one, you know? It's tastier. So there's many, many ways to help sleep. But again, an hour before bedtime, you'll be sweating. So, and then you put a nice robe on, read a nice comic book. Um, for people with fibromyalgia, most of them will also need medications to help sleep. You want to avoid benzodiazepines like Dalmain, Halcyon, because they force people into light sleep. Uh, what we talked about, for most people, insomnia, that's all they need. But in fibro, I will add 25 to 50 milligrams of trazodone, 5 milligrams of flexural, uh, Neurontin, 300 milligrams. And I will mix and match these, and maybe sometimes even the Ambien, 5 to 10 milligrams. Um, you have whatever's needed to get them sleeping eight hours a night without waking a hangover. And I will mix and match things. But I start naturally. Like I say, for most people with day-to-day -day insomnia, the natural stuff's all they're going to need. Now let's take a look at hormones. Uh, hormones are our body's communication and control system. So uh, the entire hormonal system virtually is controlled by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, thyroid, ovarian, testicular axis. So we're going to see that these, you're going to see widespread hormonal deficiencies. Um, again, as you know, thyroid is like the body's gas pedal, adrenal is a stress handler, uh, the reproductive hormones. What's critical to know is that even mild hormone deficiencies can cause widespread and severe problems. Most doctors have been taught well, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I want to give a little more background with it, that if the blood test is normal, the person's fine. Remember in med school, we had the impression that if the test was in the normal range, we didn't see an asterisk, oh good, we could check that off, no problem. And I had thought in medical school that the normal ranges were designed by wise elders who would sit in a committee, go through all the research, and say if it was in this range, no problem. It was quite a shock to me well, you know where the normal ranges come from for most lab tests. Two standard deviations. You take 100 people, the 95 in the middle, two standard deviations of the normal range. So a way that you can help people understand why the blood test is normal even though they're not. And this was, uh, Dr. Oz is a friend of mine, Lisa, his wife, a sweet couple, by the way. I do a lot of media work, and most of them are kind of, well, they're awesome. He likes this analogy. He uses it with his folks. Um, shoe sizes. If I wanted a normal range for shoe sizes, it would be 5 to 13. That would be two standard deviations. I live in Hawaii. It's a volcano. You don't want to track the lava in. We leave our shoes at the door. So say you're coming over for Mai Tais, <clears throat> and you leave your shoes at the door. Now you're putting on my size 13, and I'm wearing your size 8. And we go to the shoe doctor. And you go, Doc, the shoe's too big. He says, no, honey, it's a size 13. It's in the normal range. <laughs> I go in, I say, the shoe's too small. He says, no, nope, Jacob, it's a size 8, smack dab in the normal range. And I say, but my toe doesn't fit in it. And then he starts doing this kind of implying I'm crazy, the test is normal. <laughs> That's an exact analogy to what's going on. So what I tell the doctors, I tell people, look, when the doctor's going to do that, take a five, size 5 shoe with you to the visit, and tell the doctor, please wear the size 5 pair of shoes to the next visit. It's in the normal range, and then we'll talk. Okay? But if you tell people that analogy, they're going to understand it. So again, how do you tell if people need thyroid hormone? It's not rocket science. Tired, weight gain, achy, cold, intolerant, depression, thinning of the outer eyebrows, treat with thyroid. And it's a whole hour talk about which forms of thyroid to use and high dose T3 and the rest. But basically, treat the person, not the blood tests. Adjust the thyroid to the dose that feels the best to the person, then check the free T4 to make sure it's in the normal range for safety.
With hypothalamic dysfunction, TSH is simply not reliable. Weight gain. We mentioned average weight gain in this disease, 32 and a half pounds from the metabolic problems. So you tell people, look, once you get your metabolism working, we optimize thyroid, adrenal, acetylcarnitine, which makes it possible to lose weight, treating candida. Do you know if you don't get enough sleep, you gain an average six and a half pounds? Because sleep makes growth hormone and leptin. So when you tell people you do this and you may find your weight comes down, again, compliance goes way up. You say your weight may come down and you can have some chocolate, Mwah, they're going to love you. Okay. So adrenal. Now, for the adrenal test, we don't use two standard deviations for the normal range. To be uh, below the normal range, which is under six microgram per deciliter, you have to be in the lowest one out of 100,000. It has to be so low that you have Addison's and it can essentially kill you. Now, I've seen repeatedly where they will accidentally do two cortisol levels on the same tube of blood in the same person, same blood draw. They routinely come back four to eight microgram per deciliter different. Same tube of blood. So standard medical approach, 6.1, no problem. 5.9, life-threatening Addison's disease. And the test is only accurate within eight points? Not sane. So let me give you a very high-tech way to tell if people need adrenal support. When they come in, especially if they have a family member with them, you ask, are there periods where it's like a light switch goes off and you have three minutes to feed them or they will kill you? And they both go like this? They need adrenal support. It's that simple. Um, natural support for the adrenal gland, glandulars, vitamin C, licorice. There's uh, many, many good products that contain all of these, vitamin B5. Um, so again, bioidentical hormones, you further the rest. Now let's take a look at infections, the eye. There are over 100 infections that have been implicated in this disease. There's one that you need to know to treat in everybody with this illness. Treat them for candida. I don't do any tests for the candida. If they have fibromyalgia, I treat them. Uh, signs that are coming usually from the candida would be the sinusitis and spastic colon. Uh, I will give them probiotics, avoid sugar. I use stevia, and now they have monk fruit, which tastes actually better. Uh, Antifungals, I will give Diflucan 200 milligrams a day for six weeks. I haven't found a natural alternative that works as well. I will look for a host of other infections, mostly based on symptoms, parasites, viral antibiotic sensitive. Uh, parasites need to do a good lab that knows how to do it. Um, but the key infection to treat is the candida. But again, as I say, infection of the month club. I could just stand here for another hour and list all the infections that have been implicated. I want to wrap up a little bit looking at pain. Um, in addition to the muscle pain, when you have the chronic pain, it will then turn into small fiber neuropathy and neuropathic pain. You'll see that in about half of people who have fibromyalgia. Also in people with dysautonomia, lightheaded on standing, orthostatic intolerance. Um, you'll see the dysautonomia, you'll see small fiber neuropathy. It's diagnosed by a biopsy uh, of the skin tissue. It's a simple punch biopsy. Uh, there are a couple labs in the country that do that. The treatment is intravenous gamma globulin. I, it's expensive, and I save that for the 15% of people who are the sickest who don't respond to anything else. Not a common thing. But just to wrap up, let's wrap up with mind-body connection and a couple resources and quick pain. Uh, we talked about the mind-body connection uh, in my case, but what's in most people chronic fatigue syndrome? It's an illness of people who have low self-esteem, who are overachievers, trying to get approval from somebody who just wasn't going to give it, which if you think about it, is a recipe for blowing a fuse. If you want to teach them to get well, teach them this one simple word. It's called no. It's a great word. It's very versatile. It's a complete sentence. There's a t-shirt that said, what part of no didn't you understand? And we teach them, if something feels bad, you say no. Now they ask often, should I go to see a psychologist or for counseling? It's like any other disease. If you feel like it, go. But people go into what they have. I had chronic fatigue syndrome. My GI friends have uh, lactose intolerance. My psychiatry friends were neurotic in the beginning. Sorry, Scott. But most of them, at least here, have done their inner work and become brilliant. But many people out there are psychologists. They're just projecting their stuff all over the place. So you want to make sure the psychoanalyst is one word and not two. Okay. So pick well.
<laughs> I, I, now, there's many, many other treatments that can help in fibro. We just talked about the metabolic aspects of treatment here. So uh, that's not to exclude all these other many things that can be helpful. Um, pain, again, pain is not the enemy. It's like the oil light on your dashboard saying that something needs attention. What do we do with medically if somebody has an oil light that's flashing and they say it's annoying? We put a Band-Aid over it. You say, oh, that's better, until their motor burns out. Same with NSAIDs. NSAIDs are responsible, like Motrin kind of medications, for over 30,000 deaths a year, preventable. Natural things that are more effective in head-on studies, you'll have willow bark, boswellia, curcumin, uh, DLPA, natokinase, ginger, hops, host of things that are very effective for pain relief. Um, I'm not going to talk about this because they're uh, ending the time over here. HCG has been very helpful in two studies now for severe chronic pain in people on high-dose morphine. Uh, if you have questions about that or also medications for pain, I'll be doing the book signing after. I'm happy to take questions. I will note, by the way, on that uh, FFPN network where you can talk to other practitioners, I will also be answering questions regularly. So it's like having mentor online. If you have questions about medicine or holistic or in general, I'm there answering questions. It's free. I'm here to help you guys. I've done this 35 years. I can help keep you from having to reinvent the wheel. So I invite you to the site. So a couple of resources. Um, the two best, my two favorite textbooks, there's a textbook of natural medicine by Dr. Prezorno. Brilliant. Uh, that textbook is one of the first things I, I reach for. Uh, those of you who have iPhones and Androids, there's an app called Cures A to Z. It's about a, two million downloads now. It's a free app. Damn, I should have charged for it. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's like having my brain in your pocket in an app. And if you think from A to Z, from acne to zoster, you're wondering what to do, uh, just download it. I have iPhone and Android, and it's just very simple. You know, I, 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 tend, you know, I used to tease that when my kids said the bedtime prayers, they say, God bless mommy and daddy, and my daddy just one day give a yes or no answer. In this one on the app, it's all very bullet point and simple. You got asthma, here's what you do. Boom, boom, boom. You got all the things. So you can look it up, and it's right there. It says, here are the things, the most helpful things. Um, a very wonderful textbook that I recommend, in addition to textbook of natural medicine, get this book, Nutritional Medicine by Alan Gaby. Brilliant, well-referenced. Those are the two books that I recommend you have on your bookshelf for everybody. Um, so. We're now at the point where CFS and fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue in general, and these same principles apply to most kinds of pain, by the way. You give the body what it needs, the pain goes away. Uh, the uh, Journal of the American Academy of Pain Management came out noting that this approach is an excellent and highly effective part of the standard of practice for treating fibromyalgia. So this is a very, very treatable disease, and I want to thank you all for caring enough to be here. Thank you. <laughs>